Today, we're going to focus on organic solar cells. Um, I, I'm just going to have, have a few words discussing some of the background to, to these solar cells, and then we'll go on to, to five exciting talks. So the, um, we've already heard a little bit about organic solar cells um, on, uh, in the second symposium on Wednesday. Um, what we're essentially talking about today are solar cell, organic solar cells based on bulkhead junctions where, of course, the, the, um, they differ from the proskite cells in that um, photobiotic excitation is dominated by excitons and you separate the excitons at a donor acceptor interface. Now, by far, the biggest advance in this field over the last few years has been the, the, the shift from um, the following base acceptor, PCBM, as a, the dominating acceptor um, in these solar cells with non fluorine acceptors. Um, and you'll see one example of, of, of those non fluorine acceptors at, at the bottom there, IDTBR. And, and, and this switch from PCBM to non fluorine acceptors, NFAs as they're often called, has now led to efficiencies for single junction cells, which, while still lower than proskites, are 18% and, and, and carrying on going up. At the same time, these non fluorine acceptors um, show some advantages of stability. Um, in principle, they have lower synthesis cost, and particularly, they have greater tunability. And just to give you one example, sorry, um, uh, one example of greater tunability, um, you can see here some examples of um, the absorption by different non furin acceptors and the energetics of different non furin acceptors. And this, for example, has allowed us to tune the energetics far more effectively to match the donor polymer in order to optimize performance. It also, for example, has allowed us to think about trying to make semi-transparent devices where both the donor and the acceptor absorb in the near infrared. You can see an example of that at the bottom here. And again, and this is going to be um, one of the topics discussed, I believe, um, um, in our first talk by Professor um, um, Yip. In terms of efficiency, then this just gives you an illustration of how the single junction efficiencies have really risen over the last four years. Um, as I say, they're still behind the proskites, but they're certainly catching up. And that's, um, for those of us working in the field of organic solar cells, very exciting. Um, the black circles are all um, single junction cells. The, 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 the green star is a tandem cell. And again, I think the next talk is going to talk about the, the, the opportunities um, for, for tandem solar cells employing these exciting non fluorine acceptors. Um, Y6 is one of the most promising ones, and I suspect we're going to hear more about that in the talks this afternoon. In terms of stability, it's also um, been at least a partial success story. Um, the shift from PCBM to, for example, IDTBR has been shown to be very effective at reducing the burning losses, which limited the efficiency, the practical efficiency of many devices based on fullerene. So this is the, the burning when you shine light on a, on a, on a device um, when it's encapsulated or in nitrogen. And you can indeed see that in both these examples on the left, the, the, the burning was far less um, or indeed entirely absent in one case um, when you replace PCBM with EHRDTBR. This story is not uniform to all non fluorine acceptors. On the right, you can see an example where, um, in fact, a ternary blend based on very young IDTBR showed very good stability under, under light um, irradiation, whilst an alternative acceptor Y6, whilst giving higher performance, actually shows um, greater, um, uh, greater instabilities. And indeed, the origins of the instabilities between, um, the difference in instability between different acceptors is, I believe, going to be a topic of discussion by Professor Kim um, very shortly. We've heard a lot about proskite solar cells um, in this conference. And so I thought I'd just touch on some of the differences between the proskites and the organic solar cells. Um, when we compare the two, then one of the obvious things you've heard a lot about with the proskites is they have mobile ions, and those mobile ions will tend to screen the bulk fields in the device, and so the transport in the bulk of the, of the device is probably diffusion-driven. Um, in the organic solar cells, we, we don't have mobile ions, and so indeed when we have um, anode and cathodes with different work functions, then at short circuits you get bulk fields in the device which drive drift currents to the opposite sides. One of, the, one of the biggest differences between the organics um, materials and proskite is their difference in dielectric constant. Um, most organics have dielectric constants around three and a half, while MAP is around 25. That has many implications. It means, for example, that you get far more bound states, excitons, or interfacial charge transfer states. I'm sure we'll hear more about those this afternoon um, in the organic solar cells. And indeed, recombination losses from these excitons and these CT states are one of the limiting factors in the organic solar cells. 
Um, the organic materials are typically softer materials and, and exhibit greater non-radiative losses. And again, we're going to, I think, be hearing um, later on this afternoon about um, the, the advantages of non fluorine acceptors in reducing those non-radiative losses. In general, carrier dynamics in the organics are, um, are far slower um, than, in, than in MAPI and other proskite materials. The carrier mobilities are maybe a factor of a thousand times faster in a proskite than in most organic materials. Recombination dynamics are unfortunately not a thousand times slower in organic materials. Typically, it's only around about 10 times slower in an organic bulk junction blend compared to a proskite. That difference is probably associated with the difference in capture cost section because of a difference in dielectric constant of organic materials versus MAPI. And of course, with this challenge that the recombination is, is um, now, the biomolecular combination is now more of an issue with the organics, is one of the reasons why it's more challenging to make um, thick organic solar cells compared to proskite solar cells. So that just gives some examples of, of differences in function. We're going to hear much more about the, the, the details of function, particularly in Jenny Nelson's talk, where she'll be talking about the modeling of organic solar cells going all the way through the molecular properties to device function. One of the things I'll be going to hear quite a lot about this afternoon, and, and is indeed one of the main focuses of the last two talks this afternoon, is, has, is, has been the, the, the how being able to tune the energetics of a non fluorine acceptor has allowed us to move towards donor acceptor junctions with very small energy offsets. And indeed, we're now finding that we're, we're able to achieve quite efficient current generation, where the energy offset between the, the, low, the two LUMOs or between the two HOMOs could be remarkably, remarkably small. And this, of course, is related to the idea that um, we're now having um, organic solar cells and non fluid acceptors with a lower voltage loss, the difference between the optical band gap and VOC. Um, why the non fluid acceptors are enabling this and how it's achieved and how we understand it is, of course, a subject of con considerable discussion and controversy, and I think will be touched on in the last two talks um, this afternoon. Just to give one illustration of some of the challenges in thinking about low energy offsets. Um, and what the real energetics are in, in these organic solar cells. I've got a picture here which illustrates why the sort of picture of a, a luma luma offset and a homo homo offset um, can be an, over, an oversimplification of these devices. Um, so, for example, we have to appreciate that the exciton binding energy and indeed the optical gap of these materials is typically less than the formal homo to lumo electronic um, um, uh, um, energy gap. We also have to realize that the, the, the CT states um, may be bound, and again, their energies may be less than, in this case, the, the, the gap between the, the HOMO of the donor and the LUMO of the acceptor. We have to worry about polar one formation. And of course, um, in general, when we put a charge into these materials, we generate localized polar ones, and this localization energy can be, again, the order of hundreds of millivolts. We also have to worry about tail states. There's lots of evidence that in organic materials, you have significant density of tail states extending into the band gap. Um, and and, and, and these, can, these can all extend hundreds of millivolts. And finally, we have to worry about trying to, co to compare these, um, uh, uh, these orbital energies with the, the, quasi, the, the voltage, the quasi-fermi level splitting, which generates the upper circuit voltage. And one of the challenges here, of course, is that when you separate charge, you generate two carriers from one, and that increases entropy. Um, and the entropy increase there can be hundreds of milli electron volts. And that's uh, um, uh, both a challenge in trying to generate a high voltage. And it also suggests that when we go to the limits of very small luma luma offsets, then it's quite likely this, this entropy increase to be one of the key factors driving charge separation. <laughs> 